Hi there, and welcome to this tutorial video for Dungeons & Feelings, the hybrid social strategy board game, hopefully to be manufactured later this year. This video will be covering the tabletop simulator version of the game. The purpose of this video is to give you a high-level overview so you can see how the game is played. For specific rules, I suggest you consult the PDF instruction manual, which I will include a link to in the description below this video. We'll be going over the basic rule set, as well as simulating a three-player game, because I believe that the best way to learn something is to actually jump on in and do it. So we're gonna try to simulate that environment in this video. But please note this game can be played by between two to four players. Before we get started, I would suggest you change your lift height to the minimum setting, as well as change your rotation degrees to 90, as this will just make it easier to play. In Dungeons & Feelings, each player will be creating a dungeon of their own design using these room cards. You will proceed through your dungeon, gaining experience, leveling up, crafting items, and gaining treasure in order to become more powerful. The specific requirements for leveling up can be found on your cheat sheet. Once you're level four and you feel adequately prepared, you can add your dragon card to your dungeon provided to every player at the beginning of the game. And once you defeat the dragon, each player who hasn't gone that round can have one final turn, at which point the game ends and victory points are totaled. The criteria for victory points can also be found on your cheat sheet, but will generally consist of collecting sets of treasure, things like gaining the most experience, as well as other accomplishments. Much of Dungeons & Feelings is already set up for you, but there are still a few things left to do. First, I would recommend giving each deck in the center area a shuffle. After that, we're going to choose our character sheets. So this is a three-player game, so I'm going to pick three character sheets. I'm going to start off with this wizard for this first player. Second player, I'm going to give the knight. And then the third player, I'm going to give the sorceress. After that, I would recommend locking each character sheet. So to do that, you right click, go to toggle, and lock. This, this just prevents you from being able to move it, which will make things a bit easier as we play. So I'll do that for each one. All right, now because this is a three player game, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of all the extra character sheets that we're not using, just to clean things up. I'm also gonna get rid of everything in the fourth player's quadrant because we won't be needing it for this demo. Okay, so now we're gonna to wanna to give each player their starting inventory. So we're gonna start off with these item tokens, which are these white ones over here. We're gonna give each player two of these, and our inventory is gonna be located in this right, topmost right uh, table on each character sheet. So you're gonna to wanna to put one of these tokens next to the bomb. So this rightmost column is gonna represent our inventory. So that's where we're going to keep our tokens. The second token is going to correspond to the ammo type related to each character's starting weapon. So this wizard here, we can see that they start with a magic wand, which requires mana. So we are gonna to wanna to put this next to mana in our inventory. So I'm gonna do that for each character. So this knight, we're gonna give a bomb just like the wizard. And then the second one is going to correspond to energy because energy is needed for this melee weapon that the knight starts off with. And then the sorceress, once again, every character gets a bomb. And then we are also going to give the sorceress a mana potion which will relate to the magic weapon that the sorcerer starts off with. Okay, next we're gonna to wanna to give each character a key. So you take one of these key-shaped tokens, put it in this square denoted by the key. That's where we're gonna keep our keys throughout the game. All right, and then next we wanna give each character two treasure cards denoted by the chest on the back of them. So these can be face up. I'm going to go ahead and give each character two of these. 
Okay, and then we're going to want to give each character three room tiles, which are represented. These are the square rooms that have this gate on the back. So we're going to want to give each player three of these, and those can also be face up. And I like to keep mine at the bottom of the play area just to help keep things organized. Okay. All right. And then the last thing we're going to want to give each player are the resources. So to do that, we're going to want to create a resource deck. So what we want to do is create this sort of mini starter deck that consists of the number of resources equal to the number of players for each resource. So for example, this is a three player game. So we would want three magic cards, three glass, three wood, three metal, and three green. So you put all of that into a little deck and then you give that a shuffle. I've just gone ahead and created one just to help save some time. And then from this deck, you give each player five cards. So I'm just going to do that now. Oops, took the whole deck. Okay. All right, and then the last thing we're gonna wanna do is take three treasure cards from here and just flip them up. So this is gonna be the bank that people will be able to choose treasure cards from as they play the game. And at that point, I think we are about ready to start playing. The last thing we wanna do is place one of these orange tokens on top of the one next to level to indicate level one. And we want to put the second orange token on top of the six next to this red cross, which indicates our hit points or health. And we want to do that for each character. So the first thing you want to do at the beginning of a turn is we're going to reveal two room cards for every player. So in a three player game like this, we're going to reveal six room cards face up and we are going to draft these into our dungeon so each player starting with the player with the dealer token will go through and decide which of these they would like to add and take it so normally you'd put a little more care and thought into which ones best match your strategy but I'm just gonna quickly add each of these to each player's stash okay and then the player with the dealer token officially starts their turn. So the first thing you want to do at the beginning of your turn is add your spare room cards to your dungeon. So when it comes to building out your dungeon, you can see that the walls of the rooms can either have an open passageway, it can have a locked door, or just the bare wall. So when you build out your dungeon, you want to connect the same the same types of edges to each other. So you want open passageways to touch open passageways, walls to touch walls, and doors to touch doors. So I'm just gonna go ahead and quickly throw together my dungeon. And once again, when you're actually playing this, you'd put a little more care and attention into strategically laying out your dungeon. Okay, so I just wanna go over a really important rule here. Um, to encourage you to make a dense condensed dungeon when you go to place rooms as you can see like this one it's bordering two different edges at the time that I place it so you get a bonus for that so what you do is you take an experience and these experience tokens are going to be the same color as your pawn so I'm going to take a red token and place it in that room so for any wall above one that your room touches when you place it you would put a bonus experience so if this were touching three walls total or two above one you would put two experience in here but because it's touching two walls I'm just gonna put one bonus experience in here and this bonus will apply to any room that yields experience so we'll go over what that means later because not all rooms give you experience 
So once you complete this room, you would pick up the bonus experience as well as the normal experience that you would get from completing this room. Okay, and then I'm just going to add this blacksmith room to the top here. And for now, my dungeon is complete. So uh, just before I get started going through my dungeon, I'm going to look at my treasure that I picked up at the very beginning of the game. And I will equip it if possible. So these gloves, I can see the required level is 1, which is what each player starts out at. So I can equip these gloves. So gloves are a type of armor. So I'm going to put that just in this spot right here for armor. This weapon, this ranged weapon, we can see the required levels two, which I'm not there yet, so I'm just gonna keep this to this side. You do not have to place the dragon token uh, immediately. You can place that at a later time. Every other tile, though, is required to add it to your dungeon at the beginning of your turn. So you are allowed to go three spaces during a turn. You can go fewer if you want. So, um, the first thing I, I'm looking ahead would be this trap room over here. So I just want to talk about how to read rooms uh, real quick. So looking at this room, you can kind of read these action symbols at the bottom to figure out what's going on here. So this room is essentially saying that I either need to discard a shield item or lose an HP. And if I do that into this room, I will get two experience plus a key. So there is a logic here you can think about this character going to the room, stepping on the switch, the arrows come out of the wall, it's a trap, and if you have a shield you're able to block them, but if not, then you take damage from the arrows. So before I go in there, it would behoove me to get a shield. So you can see that these action symbols have this red outline and not all the rooms do. That red outline essentially indicates danger, so that means when I go into this room, I have to resolve the action in it immediately. Unlike a room that doesn't, like this blacksmith room, I'm allowed to go in and out at my leisure. Uh, it's not a dangerous room, so I can resolve the action. I can do the things in that room uh, at a later time if I want to. I can come back to them later. But a room like this, I must resolve immediately. So how do I get a, how do I get a shield? So I look over to my inventory section on my character sheet by the shield, and these two columns here indicate the recipe needed to craft items. In this game, we acquire items by crafting them with resources. So our shield consists of a metal and a magic. And if we craft it, we will get two shields indicated by this number two here. So fortunately, I do have both of those. So I'm just going to change my color to the red character, which will be a little easier to see what I have. So I'm going to flip these over. And I want to use metal and magic. So I'm going to use both of those. So the crafting is where the feelings in Dungeons and Feelings comes into play. So this is how this works. So on each resource is printed either a word or a phrase. So what you want to do is you want to come up with a question to get to know your players a little better, get them to share their feelings a bit, and you want that question to loosely tie together the two words or concepts on each card. So I would want to ask somebody a question that has to do with experience and success. So maybe I might ask a question like, can you talk about maybe a, a difficult experience that ended up making you a more successful person in the end. Something like that. So to determine who has to answer this question, you roll a dice. And this gave me a two. So in a three player game, if you roll a one, two, or three, the person on your left will answer. If you answer a four, five, or six, the person on your right will answer. And in a four player game, if you rolled a three or a four, uh, the person diagonal or across from you would answer. One to two would be left. Five and six would be right. But in a three-player game, basically low numbers equal left, high numbers equal right. So this knight character would answer. So as a reward for answering that question, they are allowed to take a resource identical to one used in that crafting recipe. So remember, this used metal and magic. So this player is allowed to take a metal or magic from the resource decks. So they don't take it from one of the ones that was used, they take it from these decks up here. So they're gonna go ahead and take a magic, just add that to their stash, 
and I'm gonna wanna discard these. So I'm just gonna create a little discard pile over here. So I crafted a shield. So remember, I get two shields in that recipe. So I take two items, two tokens, and I'm gonna put those in this rightmost column to indicate that I now have two shields. Okay, so now I'm ready to go plunder my dungeon. So remember, I can move three spaces, up to three spaces during a turn. So I'm gonna go into this trap room, and as these symbols here indicate, I'm going to discard a shield token and get two experience and a key. Now, because I'm countering a trap here, I'm going to take this item token and place it over the shield. If I do all five trap counters during a game, which consists of a shield, a torch, a grappling hook, speed boots, and a strength spell, these five right here, if I'm able to do all five of those, that's worth two victory points. So this is just a way to keep track of it. Typically when you use items, you just discard them, but when you counter a trap, you just wanna put it over the icon just to remember that you did it, essentially. So for doing that, for my trouble, I'm gonna take two experience plus a key. So I'll take two experience from my stash over here, put it in my XP spot on my character sheet, and I get a key. And then what you wanna do to designate that you've completed this room, you wanna take one of these yellow navigation tokens and you wanna put it over the action symbol. So that, that tells me that I've done this room, I've completed it, it's all good. So if I were to come back in here, I wouldn't need to resolve this again. I wouldn't need to discard a shield or whatever. I can just go pass through it normally because the trap has been disarmed. So the other thing that tells me is that if I ever want to come back to this room, I can do so freely. So I wouldn't need to, uh, normally if you want to pass through a wall, you need to use a bomb. Or if you want to pass through a door, you need a key. But if you've already been in a room, you can enter it freely without needing to use a bomb or a key. So that's the other thing that a navigation token tells us. Okay, so that was my first move. Remember, I'm allowed three. I can move three spaces during a turn. So my second move is going to be, I have a choice here. I could go into this room. If I want, I could use a bomb to blast through this wall and get in, or I could just go fight this spider. So I'm gonna go ahead and go fight the spider. So this is a monster, and monster rooms work a bit differently than normal rooms. You fight in turn-based fashion, so first you attack, and then the spider attacks, and you trade blows until one of you dies and the number next to the sword in the top left corner tells us how much damage the spider does. These numbers next to this red cross indicate how much health the spider has, which you can actually keep track of with your pawn as you fight, and everything surrounded by this red border. That's the loot you get when you slay that monster. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, fight this thing. So in order to fight stuff, you wanna, you're gonna use your weapons. So each player starts off with a weapon. So I have a magic wand here. It says that the attack is one and it requires mana. So remember I got a mana at the beginning of the game. So I'm gonna use that mana to fight the spider. I'm gonna discard it. And it does one damage as printed on the card. So I'm gonna move uh, the health from three to two. I did one damage and he's gonna do two to me because remember we trade blows. So when you fight monsters, it will first go through your armor and then through your health. So he's doing two damage to me. So this, this glove, you can see it says defense one. So it can basically absorb one blow. So it's, it's uh, damage. So what I like to do is just flip it upside down to indicate that it's been destroyed. I don't have to discard it. I still own it. It's just been damaged and I can repair it later. So that soaks up one damage that he did to me, but he does two, so I have to lose a hit point. All right, so now I wanna, I wanna fight him again, uh, but I have a little problem because now I'm out of ammo. So uh, I could use a bomb, because it says I can use in battle for one damage, but that's not gonna help me because I need to do two damage to him. So I'm gonna do something a little sneaky here. Uh, I'm gonna use my shield item because uh, remember, when I crafted it, I got two of them. I used one to counter this trap. I'm going to use my second one now in battle. 
So we can see here that a shield, when I use it in battle, I reflect a monster's next attack against them, and I take one damage in recoil. So you're kind of reflecting his damage back against him. So the spider, we can see, does two damage. So this actually works out great. So I'm going to use my shield against him. I'll discard this. So I'm now doing his two damage against him, which guess what? That kills the spider because he only had two HP left. And I have to take one damage in recoil as part of using a shield. So, but to me, that, that's worth a trade-off. So this spider is now slain. So I get to get all this stuff at the bottom. So I get to take a skull, which are these skull tokens. I just put them in my skull spot on my character sheet. I can get a treasure. So when I get a treasure, I can choose from the three that are face up or from the deck. Uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and take, uh, I'll take this uh, magic staff over here. It's level three, so I can't use it quite yet, but it'll be useful later on. And whenever you take something face up, just replace it with something. Okay, and I also get two experience. So I'll take two experience from here add it to my stash. All right, so I'm looking pretty good. And I completed this room, so I'm gonna take a navigation token, put it over the action symbols to designate that this room is done. So once again, if I ever return here, I don't have to fight the spider again, and I could return freely without needing to use a bomb or a key. So I think that's about all I wanna do. Remember, I have three, I can move three spaces, but I don't want to fight this Cyclops, he's far too powerful. I'm actually going to move back in here for my last move, and that will complete my turn. Okay, so next up we have the Knight's turn. So the first thing I'm going to do is equip this Helm, because it is level 1, and I am level 1, so I can equip it. And then we want to go ahead and build our dungeon. So that's typically the first thing we do. And remember, we don't have to build with the dragon card, but we have to build with everything else. So the first card I'm going to add to my dungeon is this one right here. And I want to talk about this card because it's pretty important. So this is a, res a resource card. And it is the main way that we are able to acquire these resources, which we're going to need for crafting. So the very first thing you do when you add one of these cards to your dungeon, and you know it's a resource card because it has a little symbol on the bottom that corresponds to one of the five resources, is you take three of these brown resource tokens, and you are going to want to put them on top of the resource bundles on the card. And I'll show you what to do later on. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and build out the rest of my dungeon. And I'm going to add this up here. And remember, you always have to combine like edges. Okay, and then I'm going to put this merchant in here. And remember, because it's touching two sides when I place it, I get to put a bonus experience in there because it is an experience yielding tile. And then when I resolve that, I get the bonus experience plus the normal experience I'd receive. And then I'll just throw this on over here. Okay, so now I would officially start my turn. So remember, you get to move three spaces in a turn. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enter this resource room. So when you enter a resource room, uh, you automatically just get an experience. So that's nice. Don't really have to do anything else besides that. And we can immediately start harvesting resources. So what you want to do is remove one of these brown tokens as soon as you enter it and take the resource of that type. So this is metal, as indicated by the metal symbol. We'll add that to our stash. And then we want to take one of our navigation tokens, these yellow ones, and put it over the action symbols at the bottom to indicate that we've been in this room so if we ever want to come back we can do so freely. So what happens after this is that at the beginning of our next turn the very first thing we do is we're going to want to get rid of discard another one of these item tokens and then take another metal and then at the beginning of the next turn after that we do the same thing. So all told from every resource tile 
over the course of the next three turns, you will gain three resource cards. And the best thing is, I don't have to stay in this room in order to get those. I can leave from here, and at the beginning of the next two turns, I would get resources. Okay. So after that, now I have a decision to make on where I want to go in my dungeon, but I think I'm just going to keep trudging forward. So I want to go into this treasure chest room. Oops, pawn fell. But you see it's got a door in the way. So if I want to move into this room here, I need to use one of my keys. So I'll just take my key and discard it. All right, now I'm in this treasure room. Now because this treasure room does not have that red outline that you see on some of the other rooms, that means that I do not have to resolve this immediately. If I wanted, I could keep going and not open up this chest, but I didn't come in here not to open up the chest, so that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, but you'll notice it says that I need a key in order to get the two treasures from this room, but I don't have any keys, so what can I do? Well, I had mentioned previously that one of your universal abilities, which is also repeated on this cheat sheet card, is that I can lose one health in lieu of a bomb or a key. So I'm going to do that. So I'm basically going to sacrifice a health point here to serve as a key. So now I can get the two treasure cards. So I'm going to go ahead and take these gloves and you automatically replace it and uh, I'll take this armor too and they're level 3 so I can't quite equip them yet but they'll be useful later on so this room is now resolved so I want to take a navigation token and put it over the action symbols to indicate that I've already done this if I were to go into this room and not open this chest I would just put this somewhere else in the room so that tell me, tells me that I could come back and open the chest if I wanted to but I did open it so I put it over the action symbols. So that was my second move, so I've got one more. So I'm gonna move into this uh, fountain room, and you can see here, let me spin the camera around so we can see. Uh, it says that we can get plus two HP uh, for free, without really having to do anything. So I'm gonna go ahead and utilize that. So I only have a uh, five, so I can't have more than six, So, but I will at least get back to uh, full health here. And I'll put a navigation token over the action symbols to indicate that I had completed that room. And I've moved my three spaces, so I would typically end my turn right now. But you'll notice that I have, right now I have seven resource cards. And in this game, you cannot end your turn with more than five. So at that point, you have to craft something. So that's what I'm going to do. So let me flip these over. And I'm going to go ahead and craft something. So why don't we take a wood and a glass here. And if we look over on our crafting section of our character sheet, we can see that a wooden glass gives us a magic mirror, it will give us two in fact. So now, remember I wanna go ahead and think of some kind of question that combines awe-inspiring and memory. So I might ask something like, did you ever go on a trip, a vacation or something, and you saw something awe-inspiring in it uh, create a lasting memory for you. Something like that. So in order to determine who has to answer that question, I would roll a, roll a die. And that's a four. And we know that if we roll a four, five, or six in a three-player game, the person on the right would answer. So this wizard character would answer that question, and as a reward for answering, they would take either a glass or a wood from these resource decks. So we'll go ahead and take a wood, add that to their stash, and then you can go ahead and discard these. And I will take two resource tokens, and I will put them right here next to the magic mirror. So now I have two magic mirrors in my inventory that I could use if I want. And I'm now under the threshold. I have five cards, so I can end my turn. Okay, so now we begin the sorceress's turn. So I'm just going to rotate my camera just to give us a better perspective. And the first thing we do is build out our dungeon. All right, so I will take my warp card, place it up there. Uh, let's take this blacksmith, place it next to my start. I'm going to place my merchant in this corner. Remember, because it's touching two edges at the time that I place it. I can put a bonus experience in there, and then when I resolve that room, I will get the bonus experience as well as the normal experience I'd accrue. 
Great. Place this resource room down here. And remember with resource rooms, the first thing we do is we put three of these brown tokens on the three resource bundles. And then I'll put the second warp room in here. And once again, this one's touching two sides as well. And it is an experience yielding tile. So I'll put a bonus in there as well. Okay. So now I would start my actual turn. Let me just flip these upside down. I can't equip this melee weapon, so I'm just going to leave it on the side. So remember, I can move three spaces in a turn. So the first thing I'm going to do is go into this blacksmith room. This room is pretty unique. I'll rotate the camera to get a better angle. So you can see this room actually has two separate, unique, independent functions. The first is telling us that we can exchange a treasure for another treasure. We can also repair our armor. And remember, if you ever need help with these symbols, they're printed on the back of the cheat sheet. And you can solve one of these or neither of them. It's your choice. So I am going to utilize the treasure exchanging capability. So I am going to trade in my level three melee weapon for this guild ring up here. So I'll put the melee weapon where the guild ring was. And this is an accessory, it does not have a level requirement, so I can just equip it automatically. And you can see here that it says that I can trade any color gem with the merchants. So first I'll put a navigation token over the treasure exchanging action symbol. So I'm still leaving the action symbols open for the armor repair, so I can always come back here and utilize that ability. So the reason I picked up that guild ring is because I know the next room I, I'm going to want to go in is this one over here. Now this has a merchant who wants a green gem, uh, which I don't have. I have a red gem. But because of this guild ring, I can trade any color gem with the merchant. So this will be valid. So I'm going to want to go into this room. And because there's a door here, I need to use a key. So I will discard my key token. And like we said before, this merchant wants a gem. I can exchange my red one. Now, anytime you exchange a gem with a merchant, you want to make sure to put it under the traded gem section of your character sheet. And the reason we want to do that is because over the course of the game, if we can exchange the three different gem types, which are red, blue, and green, that is worth two victory points. So we want to be able to keep track of that as we go. All right, so I gave the merchant the gem that they were looking for, so I can pick up two treasures. So let me go ahead and pick, I'm just gonna take two from the from the pile over here. Let's see what I get, I get a blue gem. And I get gloves, okay. They're level two, so I can't equip them yet, but I can once I'm level two. So I get two treasure, plus I get one experience. So I'll take the experience and because I resolve this room, I also get my bonus experience. So that's why we want to, tr when we build out our dungeon, we really want to be cognizant of that ability. And then like always, I put a navigation token over the action symbols to tell me that I've been in this room and that I can come back to it freely without the use of a key or a bomb. All right, so that was two moves. So I still have one left. So I'm gonna go into this room, this warp room. And this is another kind of unique room like the blacksmith. So let me rotate the camera here so we can see. So the warp room is another that has two functions. The first function is to be able to exchange resources. We can exchange one resource for another from the bank. And then also for every, this is telling us that for every warp room that we connect, we get one experience per room. So we want to connect these warp rooms. I can see that I have two on my board right now, and to connect them, all you have to do is travel between them. So traveling between warp rooms doesn't cost anything against our movement total during our turn. So we've already moved our three spaces, but I can travel back and forth between these as much as I want. They're, you know, I'm just warping from one to the other, I'm not actually traveling. And anytime I connect a warp room to my network of warps, I get an experience. So I'm gonna con I'm gonna travel from this one to this one, thus connecting them, and thus giving me an experience for each one. So I will get two experience, because I connected two rooms. And this one had the bonus experience in it. So I'll pick up that as well. And now I have five, so I'm actually gonna go ahead and exchange this five for just one of these larger tokens that represents five. So it's just a little easier to keep track of. 
And then I want to put a navigation token over the symbols that correspond to connecting warps. I did it in each one. And then, just for fun, I will also utilize the second ability of a warp room so I can exchange a resource. So I'm going to go ahead and exchange this metal for a grain. All right. And I can, because I did that, want to put a navigation token over that symbol to say that I can't do that again. And that was three moves, so that's really my turn there, so I'm going to end. So now all the players have had their turn, and the round ends. So once that happens, you want to pass the dealer token to the next character going clockwise, which would be this knight, and you would start the next round. And remember, each round always begins by putting out two room cards for each player. And you would go ahead and draft these into your tiles. And then each player, starting with the character with the dealer token, would have their turn. And you would essentially repeat this process over until one character was level 4 and felt confident in fighting their dragon. And they would add that dragon tile to their dungeon. And the dragon tile is unique because it can be attached anywhere. So you can see it's got these portals on it so you can put it against a wall or an open passage or a door it doesn't matter and you can go into it freely and once the dragon has been defeated each player who did not go that round gets one final turn and the game ends at that point you would tally up who has the most victory points and declare a winner so i hope you enjoyed this tutorial on Dungeons and Feelings. I hope it kind of gave you a feel for what it's like to play it, kind of sitting in the shoes of people who are actually going through their turns. And look for it to be printed later this year. Thanks for watching.